Even then, they weighed on me differently when encountered in the original setting. Consider first the perpetrators. Though the genocide in Rwanda was, was incited, organized, and executed by public officials and their agents, there was mass participation by ordinary citizens. Admittedly, Hutus, unwilling to take part, were targeted. Still, the cast of killers is astonishing. Members, teachers, nurses, priests, human rights workers. It's not easy to grab with, with the thought that a person's life is impacted <coughs> by the very things one would turn to in times of trouble. How does one come to terms with the fact that human lives are wantonly taken by those who normally cherish and minister to human beings? A similar puzzlement attends the identity of the victims. During the proceedings of the trials of officials of the Ethiopian military government, I recall being struck by the fact that the age of victims ranged from 90 to 9. In the Rwandan genocide against the Tutsi, there seemed to be no limit on who is to be killed. Babies and even the unborn were not spared. A great deal has been said, as you know, about the uniqueness of the Holocaust. Indeed, by now, the claim is so widely taken for granted that it's rarely questioned or vindicated. In his book, The Holocaust in History, Michael Eremares offers an argument, and I quote, Unlike the case with any other group, and unlike the massacres before or since, every single one of the millions of targeted Jews was to be murdered. Eradication was to be total. In principle, no Jew was to escape. In this important respect, the Nazis' assault upon Jewry differed from the campaign against other peoples and groups, gypsies, Jehovah's Witnesses, homosexuals, Poles, Ukrainians, and so on. Assaults on these people could, could indeed be murderous, their victims number in the millions, and their ashes mingled with those of the Jews in Auschwitz and many other camps in Europe. But the Nazi ideology did not require their total disappearance. In this aspect, the fate of the Jews was unique. End of quote. At the risk of being unfair, since the book antedates the, the Rwandan genocide against the Tutsis, isn't the Rwandan case a clear counterexample to the argument put forward for the uniqueness of the Holocaust? The sites of the killings in Rwanda are also revealing about the singularity of the genocide. The bloodshed took place in churches, hospitals, and schools, places that are considered spiritual or, se or secular sanctuaries and were often seen as such by the victims, were suddenly transformed into slaughterhouses. The weapons used in the killings were markedly different from the modern bureaucratic and technological machinery we tend to associate with the Holocaust. Many of the killers in Rwanda wielded clubs, machetes, and axes. All these weapons call for direct, brutal contact between killer and victim. Given the numbers of those killed and the swift pace of the killings, the genocide thus necessitated active mass participation. This underscores the power of hate speech and other tools of mass psychology for demonizing the victims and for their effective portrayal as undeserving of treatment as fellow humans. It also sorry, it also indicates why survivors and others in Rwanda stressed the significance of following their example and displaying the weapons in any memorialization of the genocide. Other aspects of memorialization in Rwanda merit special attention. Our attendance of the closure of the annual 100 days mourning raises questions. For, for instance, whether a time of mourning should be set aside for red terror victims in Ethiopia. Rwanda's organized survivors groups including an organization for genocide orphans, suggest that their mobilized engagement in the world of memorials, beyond supporting their individual and collective survival, imparts life to memorialization. Their testimonials alone are among the most moving aspects of the Rwandian memorialization effort. It's humbling to come face to face with the sole survivor of a family with the courage to draw deeply on his or her own tragic experience. I hope that these somewhat random observations about the Rwandan genocide against the Tutsi and its memorialization show that the consultative meetings can serve 
to engender the thoughts and poems we seek to exemplify in the AU Human Rights Memorial. The Rwandan session has set a high standard that this and subsequent meetings must try to emulate. My best wishes for fruitful deliberations. Thank you. Upon the representative of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ato Shetu Trahum, to deliver his opening address. Thank you. Excellency Professor Andreas Shete, Chairman of the African Human Rights Memorial and Advisor of the Prime Minister, members of the Interim Board, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to express my appreciation to the African Human Rights Memorial and Inter-Africa Group for inviting us to attend this consultative let me convey the apologies of my principal, Her Excellency Ambassador Konji Sinagorgis, permanent representative of Ethiopia to the African Union and UNECA, chairperson of the permanent representative committee, who would like to attend this meeting, but was unable to do so since she is in New York for the 68th session of the United Nations General Assembly. Excellencies, we are indeed very happy to note this consultative meeting is taking place in Addis Ababa. As you all know, we in Ethiopia have passed through a gruesome history. The agonies of the rare terror and other atrocities committed in our country in the past are still fresh in our minds. I wish to note what my minister had stated during the commemoration of the 90th anniversary of the genocide in Rwanda on 7th April 9, 2013, highlighting the importance of AUHRM not only to preserve the memory of mass atrocities committed in Ethiopia and elsewhere in our continent, but also to prevent future recurrence of such crimes. He therefore underscored the need to spare no effort to enable the memorial achieve its central objectives of becoming a permanent center where people from all over the world gather to reflect on the sanctity of life and serve as a place where our policymakers renew their collective commitment to prevent atrocious crimes such as genocide from happening ever again on our continent. It is in, in this spirit that we support the AUHR. <laughs> Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Ethiopia has turned its dark chapter and ushered in a new era <coughs> of peace and prosperity. We have guaranteed the rights of our peoples and democratic governance, though still a work in progress is slowly but surely taking deeper roots. I am also pleased to note that democratic governance, human rights, and the rule of law is becoming the norm rather than exception in much of Africa. The establishment of AU, HRM, is a clear demonstration of Africa's unwavering commitment to uphold principles of democratic governance, human rights, and the rule of law in the continent. I have no doubt that the memorial will have significant contribution in nurturing those important values which we all subscribe to. The holding of this consultative meeting will certainly go a long way in synthesizing all the relevant stakeholders and about the memorial and its cardinal objectives. It will also afford us the opportunity to share experiences on how, memorial, uh, on how to memorialize past atrocities and promote human rights. Having said this, let me once again reiterate 
my country's commitment to fully support AOHRM. I conclude my remarks by wishing this meeting every success. I thank you. Thank you very much, Atushetu. Uh, I now request participants to introduce each other before we see a short film. Shall we start with you? I've been teaching the history of Ethiopia and Africa for the last three de decades and a little more. Uh, my uh, area of research is 19th and 20th century uh, Ethiopian history. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ian Campbell. I'm a private scholar of Ethiopian history. Uh, and one of my interests is the uh, Italian occupation period, which I'll be talking about today. I was on it, my name was the Bad I don't know what Sarah University for social studies in Japan and the sciences. Uh, and the story. I too am a historian. My name is Gamuta Rekai, a research retiree, academic retiree from the United States. <coughs> Good morning, my name is Juanita Bennett. I'm from District 6 Museum in Cape Town, South Africa, um, a museum that commemorates the displacement of Anna Good morning, my name is Tony Weiss. I'm a PhD student at the University of Oxford and was until recently at the University of uh, here in Addis Ababa. And I've been working with you a little bit on the Ethiopian Med Health Documentation Center for the past couple of years. My name is Rachel Eva, and um, I'm just a South Africa Connection Director in London, and I am also attached to the Institute of Commonwealth Studies and um, Research on Memorialization. <laughs> My name is Eileen O'Grady, and I am an interested member <laughs> of this staff. I'm a professor for the African Union Human Rights Commons. My name is Hugh Atamara, and I'm a writer of Sense of Politics. My name is Captain Chayo Mikhail. I'm one of the survivors side of the scene for this uh, interview. My name is Helo Kachapa. I'm an interested in your <laughs> My name is Kazao Mbrahadu. I am the staff member of the Department of Political Science. My name is Ted Lai from South uh, Africa Group. And uh, I'm also a contributor for local magazines today. Good morning. Good morning everyone. My name is Asmao Ingrudis. I'm the journalist uh, and I'm interested to us in this uh, event uh, in my own. My name is Gua. Um, I'm a lawyer. I also volunteer at the office of um, the Ethiopian Military Documentation. I am Yosef Kios. I serve for Special Prosecutor Office for the last three years as a prosecutor. My name is Makon Nolde from Ethiopia Red Arab Markets Memorial Museum. My name is Makon Nolde, I am from the State Actors Coalition. My name is Amru Tamrat, uh, I'd like also to say that I was a former prisoner in different prisons uh, in Ethiopia during the death relief. I'm a lawyer by profession. I'm also a member of the advisory committee of the UN Human Rights Council. Good morning, everyone. My name is Fabanjo Mulisa. I'm from Rwanda. I work at Chile Genocide Memorial, and the Chile Genocide Memorial is managed by 
tried. It is trust. A eucalyptus and you and prevents genocide worldwide. So I'm here representing it is, it is trust on behalf of each of the Ghana. Uh, I study Ethiopia. Uh, I am the author uh, of the first comparative study of the Ethiopian Revolution and the Cambodian Revolution. Uh, revolution and genocide in Ethiopia and Cambodia. Uh, and I have been working uh, on the study of genocide from a comparative perspective. Uh, I am a professor uh, at the University of South Florida in the United States. And I've been working very closely with Hirut Herod Abebejiri, uh, a really big in the Ethiopian Red Terror uh, Documentation Research Center, a very paramount uh, research center uh, in the world. And I'm very, very happy to be here to represent her, I represent myself, and then also participate in our collective endeavor for the Human Rights Memorial. Thank you, everybody. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Clementine Wambuha. I'm representing the Indus of Rwanda in Ethiopia. Um, and uh, while I still have a mic, I would like to thank the partners of uh, AU Human Rights Memorial, uh, the Interim Board, the Justice Africa and the Inter Africa Groups, and uh, all people who has a hand in the, uh, in the process of uh, establishing the AU Human Rights Memorial. Allow me also to uh, express the sincere apology from my ambassador, His Excellency uh, Joseph Stengemana. Uh, due to prior commitments, he could not be with us today. But he told, he told me to tell you that he will be with you in heart and I will be well a representative of his uh, uh, his views and um, you know that he is really committed to this process. Thank you. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Oxford and my research focuses on the history of the Ethiopian Red Terror, uh, focusing particularly on the social and political history in Antitabula 76 to 78. My name is uh, Shibru Katla. I work for the Ethiopian Academy of Sciences. Hi, I'm Shete Talaman. Um, I'm working with Ambassador Kojit, who dedicated this her country for the last 51 years. Maybe she's the first to serve that long in the history of civil servants of the Ethiopia. It was conveniently uh, not included that name on the agenda or on the program to show us the film. Thank you. First, I want to thank uh, my good friend Tamrat and his colleagues uh, for giving me the privilege to chair this panel of two distinguished scholars. To my right is Mr. Ian Campbell, who worked in a very meticulously crafted historical work of a long neglected thing in Ethiopian history. To me, it reads like a detective story. It is really a thriller. And we should be grateful to Mr. Campbell for giving us this wonderful gift. And I wish to congratulate you. Today, he will be speaking more or less on the same topic, probably giving us an overview or an idea of his large book. And he will be the first speaker.
Our second speaker is my friend and colleague, Professor Shifra Borkale, a member of the History Department, long time member of the History Department at Addis Ababa University. He has written extensively on Ethiopian history, particularly on the 19th and 20th century, and more particularly on his economic history. I don't think there is any area in Ethiopian history that is unknown, not, not known to Shifara. I feel strongly, actually, that Shifara is the encyclopedia of Ethiopian history. <laughs> Today, he will talk on the red terror for aspects of it in our second speaker. So, uh, without much ado, yeah, it's yours. I'd like to. I'd like to that placed great importance on strength, violence, and war, which was regarded as something beautiful. Fascism reached a point where it had not achieved a great deal, and Mussolini needed a conquest, a military conquest, to bind the Italians around himself and around fascism. His choice was to invade Ethiopia, the main reasons he chose Ethiopia was that, one, that Ethiopia had very little military capacity in modern terms. Secondly, he could persuade the young men who were to join the army that it was in revenge for Adwa, which was the famous Battle of Adwa, where the Ethiopians defeated the Italians in 1896. Thirdly, he could claim that Italy needs a colony. It needs colonies to be on a par with the great powers of, uh, of Great Britain and France, as they were then called. And fourthly, he could claim that it was a civilizing mission to bring good governance to Ethiopia. So you see, the reason he invaded was not actually revenge for Adwa. It was a political reason. But revenge for Adwa appealed to the young brothers and the sons of the people who had fought at Adwa. The invasion began, as you saw in the last film, in August 1935. The Italians had one of the most advanced air forces in Europe. They also used extensively chemical weapons and flamethrowers, which were actually banned by international convention at that time. <clears throat> in May 1936, they reached this city, and that uh, was the beginning of the Italian occupation. Here you see you see Richard Pankhurst, those of you who may know him, at the age of about 10, reading his mother's newspaper. His mother, of course, launched a global campaign against Mussolini's invasion of Ethiopia. <clears throat> Addis Ababa in 1935. Well, you'll often see pictures like this of Italy, the Viceroy and head of the military. But life here was actually dominated by the party, rather like during the Dirk where organizations had a parallel system of the party that ran alongside the official administration. These are black shirts, the paramilitary of the party, which came under the control of Guido Cortese. There was something of a war going on much of the time between Graziani, who was running the government, and Cortese, who was running the party. So broad-minded so all-inclusive, and yet speaks like a mathematician. Mm -hmm. Such precision, such exactness. What a wonderful gift. Thank you so much. Uh, our next speaker is uh, my colleague, Shifara, Professor Shifara Bakale. Thank you, sir. Foremost to thank the organizers of this conference for giving me the opportunity to speak on this very important uh, gathering. The organizers of the conference have also made my life quite simple by giving me a couple of questions 
and I was told that I should focus on these questions. Uh, I will read out these questions. What were the historical events that brought the dirt to power and the massacres that followed? The second question, what were the Red Terror campaign and the extent of human and societal destruction? I'll try to respond to these questions uh, as much as I could in the time that I'm given. Uh, the, the questions here have already been addressed by uh, several scholars. Some of them are here among us. There is Professor Baru, who has written on aspects of the Ethical Revolution. There is Professor Gelgo, who has already published a book uh, on another aspect of the revolution. Uh, other scholars, both uh, from abroad and from uh, Ethiopians also, have written extensively on, on uh, different aspects of the Ethiopian revolution, including the emergence of the dirt. The approach that Professor Gerbo took should, uh, should be followed up uh, in the future more and more, because Professor Gerbo zeroed in on a number of military engagements between the Ethiopian army in those days and the Somalis and so on, and uh, reconstructed a detailed history of a number of battles. In the same fashion, we have to look at uh, local history during the revolution. For instance, we have to look at Kabbalis and Kaftanias. We have to look at some of the most notorious towns, Gondar town, Walkite uh, in Buragi, Waliso. Undeva. We have to look at Harar, at Dreda, uh, and many other places uh, in Ethiopia. And in so doing, we'll be able to build up uh, a comprehensive account of what happened in the country uh, in those uh, very uh, terrible years. This kind of work would also enable us to come up with a more reliable uh, figure of the victims. At the moment, um, we are not sure of exactly how many people lost their lives, were tortured, suffered. Uh, we, we do not have an idea of uh, the number of women, children, men. We have only estimates, and the estimates vary from author to author, from informant to informant. Looking at the issues from a local point of view would help us build up a more, uh, a more credible account and a more, we may be able to arrive at a, uh, at a figure that would approach the real, uh, the real situation. On the other hand, we are very lucky because the victims are writing. The victims are writing in increasing numbers and they are giving us details of uh, of the, the process through which they passed. Recently, uh, Addis Ababa was hit. It was very sensational with the appearance of Hiro Tafarra's book, Tower in the Sky. <coughs> then, following shortly after the, the, the appearance of her book, and we have had a lot of discussion, animated discussion and debates, then Marara Budina published is our memoir in which he devoted uh, a good section to which he also devoted a good section of his book to to give an account of some of his experiences in prison uh, before in prison time how he was captured and so on. Both Hiots and Marara's books are very important because they shed light on on aspects of uh, the history of that period which are not touched by uh, memoir writers before, by historians before extensively. Yota Farah brought out the story of Mepita uh, Chomaru uh, and Rana Mesa important political leaders who were, uh, who were, uh, who were uh, pushed out of the party, out of the APRP, because they were regard their, their ideas were not accepted by the and the story of how 
this uh, event evolved and developed was not known until he was uh, published this book. Kiyo's book goes well beyond that, and she gives us a wonderful account of the lives of women in prison, the sufferings and torture of women in prison also. When you come to Marara, he, his book, In As Far As I'm Concerned, is a third book to be produced by members of uh, an important party at the time, the Mason Party. The first book that was produced, the first memoir, was by Wargo Arada, and the second one was by Andabracho II. Now the third is Marara Budina's uh, book. And so we're getting to know more and more about the inner life of Mason also. Uh, as uh, participants uh, sit down and write their accounts. Uh, yet another very interesting book was entitled Yasin yeah, Africa. It is an account of uh, the base area in, uh, uh, in Asimba that uh, the APRP established. The, the author was uh, there, a fighter, and he gives a detailed, a very, very interesting account of how things evolved, how life, uh, what life looked like uh, in those places. This book also gives us uh, a, di a different perspective because so far we have been focusing on the center whenever we talk about the revolution. Um, but Asim Basfek takes us to the peripheral areas and uh, invites us to look at the situation from that angle. Memoirs have not been coming out of uh, prison experiences in the provinces torture experiences and, and so on in the provinces. So, uh, you know, people like uh, the, the writing of a book like Asimba Africa is a good encouragement to people in the provinces uh, for people who, who have suffered in the provinces to record their memoirs. There is only another book that was published on this topic and it's entitled Dhammanash, which gives us a very graphic account of the situation that only gives us uh, an insight, uh, uh, a small view of the situation in the provinces. Gondor was very notorious. Buraga areas were also very notorious and very many young people died. It is the same in Harar and Harar. It is also the same in Wurlo. Uh, Some of the government people are notorious, have gone into the popular mind. Manak Tafara of Gondor, uh, uh, is very well known to Ethiopians now. The archives are there and they need to be accessible to the public and we are waiting for the day when the government will put them at the disposal of researchers. Uh, I would like to take this occasion uh, to bring to mind the fact that the, the Special Prosecutor's Office had uh, brought together a very huge archive for the prosecution of the perpetrators of red terror and so on. Now the court proceedings are over, it is time to put them at the disposal of, of researchers. Uh, there are some very important people here in this hall, and I would like to appeal to them to do something about these archives to make them accessible to researchers. The dark side of the story was not also uh, neglected, Quite a few books have, been, have come out over the years, and I have only mentioned the ones that have come out very recently. And the book by Mamisu Hainamari, his own memoir, uh, was a recent appearance. Uh, he repeats some of the, the, some of the things he has said to Bernat, uh, to, a, to a journalist by the name of Bernat, a few several years ago. Nevertheless, he also adds very many things. Many people are disappointed by this memoir because there is an attempt to explain away all of the things he did and to, uh, to, 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 to portray himself as an uh, innocent person. Nevertheless, that book is, uh, is an important addition to uh, the corpus uh, of works that have come out uh, so far. On the basis of these memoirs uh, that are pu published in the form of books uh, and newspaper articles uh, and so on, 
Uh, I try to uh, give a very short, brief uh, account of how the dirt was formed in order to explain how uh, this particular group of people came to power. I, will, uh, I, will, uh, uh, I have preferred to, give, uh, to narrate the story rather than to go into analysis. <coughs> when you read the literature, the historical works that are produced on this period, and when you read uh, government publications in the, in the period of the Derg and even now, you newspapers and so on, you find that the Derg was established on Sunday 21. Uh, uh, in English it is June 28. Uh, that is not, uh, that's not uh, correct. Uh, the events go back several days and 21 Sunday or June 28 was a culmination of, of a process. And that was the day when they reorganized themselves uh, rather than established uh, the uh, The military intervention in Ethiopia uh, uh, in, in, those, in those days starts in June, uh, in January 1974 with the Negeli uh, uh, mutiny. The Negeli mutiny is uh, very important because it was organized by NCOs and very junior officers. The commanding officer was Colonel Marel Nukuse, who later became uh, a general and was eventually executed by the uh, He knew about it, he reported uh, it, but he, he, he stayed behind. He did not take part of it. So these were uh, NCOs and privates and uh, very junior officers who organized the duty. And the demand was, uh, was very simple. It had to do with the improvement of their own lives. This Nagelle revolt was, was the first major thing. And in official Derga accounts, you don't, you don't find it has uh, taken as the first military revolt. They say the first military revolt was the one that uh, took place in February, on February 18. Uh, February 18, that's to say a week after the revolution started, the army came out on the streets, starting with the Asmara garrison, and then uh, the garrisons in Aksaba and so on joined those forces. They again had very simple demands, and that has to do summarized uh, raids of their summit, improving their conditions. Here again, the senior officers were regarded as, uh, as part of the establishment. They were not part of this mutiny. It was junior officers, NCOs, and privates who were actively uh, engaged in this, in this movement. So the February 18 uh, mutiny was the second uh, mutiny uh, uh, in, in 1974. They got their, their demands were satisfied by the government, and they went back to the palace. And very quickly there was an uproar, uh, popular outbreak condemning them for, uh, for going back to the barracks after, after uh, getting their salary raised. This had an impact on the junior officers. This, and in their memoirs, almost everyone refers to this uh, public criticism of the army, uh, asking uh, only their own their own questions and getting back to the barracks after their questions were, after their demands were satisfied. Uh, this seems to have had a big impact and then the situation within the army becomes very, um, very dynamic, so to speak. And junior officers now uh, become uh, very active, uh, they become very political. In this situation, I should bring in one uh, important, uh, important, uh, important uh, development from the past. Uh, the army, the police, the air force used to send some of its most promising young people to the university to do their studies uh, for one degree or another. Young officers were sent to do their... Uh, and some of them had already gotten their degrees, others were in the process of... Uh, were in the, in the university studying, and quite a few of these were under the influence of, radical, of the radical students, of the student movement. Now, these people who are under the influence of the radical groups 
now became very active uh, uh, within their uh, within their uh, garrisons. So in, after February 18, and the salary and the army going back, and the uh, Dalcacho coming to power and so on, the situation calms down a little bit, but within the army, the officers, the young officers, uh, and uh, the NCOs were very rested. The government of Dalcacho, uh, McConnell, realized this danger, and they tried to hijack it, and <coughs> The third military mutiny was again organized in April, and the end of the, the end result of, of this was the, the establishment of a commission headed by Colonel Alamzod, the uh, commander of the airborne division. Alamzod was related to the prime minister; the, he was loyal to the to, to the group who were in government, and the idea was to hijack the military movement and to make it uh, more loyal to, to the government. This was uh, noted by all the you know, militant officers, uh, radically inclined officers, uh, and others very active in the, in the, in the current politics in those days in the army. And we see uh, a process of setting up committees uh, uh, in various garrisons around the country. We don't know exactly when it was set up, who were the members, and so on, because so far the information that has come to light is not sufficient for this. But we know that, for instance, Asmara had a committee that was organizing uh, uh, the political movement, that, was, uh, that had clandestine meetings, and so on. We also know that one of the leading figures was Nasibu Tayyip, who eventually became an important we know now that in Harar, Mangisu Ayla Mariam was also very active. Uh, there was a group around Mangisu Ayla Mariam. There were people like Legas like Asfaw and so on with him. And they too were very active, uh, following politics and conspiring all the time, uh, uh, establishing contacts with Asmara, with Akisabra, and so on. The most uh, active and uh, very consciously uh, organized group was the Akisabra group in which we find people like uh, Atna Fuabata, at the time he was a major, Tafara Taklab, a very, uh, a very energetic uh, and a, a, a man who had very clear, uh, clear views. Uh, he knew what he, what he wanted. Then there are others less visible in the revolution, like Abara Aga and so on. These people were, uh, had already formed groups and they were uh, uh, they were uh, following events and they were debating and discussing how to uh, organize the uh, next mutiny in order to overthrow the government. Tabar Ataklab was a good friend of Mengistu al -Maram. His base was in Harar, but he was here in Addis Ababa doing his studies in the university, engineering student. Uh, Atlafu Abata himself was a student uh, in the university, maybe in his last year in college, doing law, <coughs> according to some sources. So Tafarat Akla was connected with the people in Harar, and again, they were also connected with the people in, in Asmara, where in these places where there was uh, a very size of garrisons. Now, uh, Atmafu at the same time was involved, but you know, for political purposes, was involved with the Congo veterans. There were the Congo veterans who, play, who were continuously complaining that they were not given their dues, the money that the UA uh, allocated to them, they, uh, they claim, was taken away by corrupt government officials, and so they were cont continuously protesting. So finally in June, the Addis Ababa group decides to act, and I have to skip a number of uh, uh, events, like the Congo veterans going to the emperor, complaining, uh, etc. Uh, and on June 17, they carry out uh, their, uh, their final, uh, final um, shall we call it revolt, military revolt. They occupy key areas in Addis Ababa, strategic areas in Addis Ababa. That day and that night, they were busy uh, doing this. And 
Mangistu Arnafu was busy uh, <coughs> organizing this, and in the headquarters, Tafara was busy getting in touch with the various garrisons around the country. And on the second day, they have already decided how to do it. They sent, uh, they sent telegraphic messages to all the units around the country, the police forces, uh, territorial <coughs> army, uh, airborne division, and so on, to send their representatives to us. In many cases, the representatives were already there at Rome. People were very active, organizing the small movements in the garrisons. For instance, in the Harar garrison, the group was active, we know from different sources, and there were the ones who came from. There were some additions. Actually, within the group, the active were there. Uh, from Asmara, the active were very active all along, where the guys were selected and who came. Some people were sent because they were bad guys, uh, troublemakers, and so on. But generally, the key figures were those who were very active uh, uh, in the movements between uh, the months of February and etc. Et <coughs> the Hara group concluded that the group there has not really, did not really define their purpose, their objective very well, that they were not really well organized uh, in the afternoon session, by what they saw in the afternoon session. So on the morrow, uh, they presented their proposal. The, 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 the proposal was presented by Magistro. He said they should be reorganized uh, in, a, in a way that would make them more effective. He said, he intimated, he did not clearly say that their aim should be to overthrow the government. Because there are some elements within the group who were still loyal to Ibrahim. So what he said was, we should bring about change, fundamental change. In order to bring about fundamental change, we should be organized in such and such a manner. The group was convinced. He gave them the motto, Ethiopia Take Down. He wrote it on the board for them. And then he said, if you accept this structure of the dirt, Executive Committee, a Permanent Committee, and then Operations Committee, a very key committee, and then another committee for administrative purposes. <coughs> they accepted it, and so they said, we should now go into election. And they started the election. Of course, they elected him as the chairman. Adnafu became the vice chairman, and then they gave him the right to elect the secretary, uh, because uh, he demanded to be given the right to elect the secretary, since he had to work very closely with the secretary, the group accepted this, and he elected his own very close friend, the man who came from Haran, Gabriel uh, Solna. So this is how they came. In a week's time, they seized state power, effectively, in effect. The emperor was restricted to, to, to the palace and 10 kilometers, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a specific kilometer, the, to a few kilometers around the palace. Uh, the top decision-making regarding the state and country now uh, was pushed into their country. Even if, in actual fact, there was the government of Adal Pachum and then there was the emperor, and they paid tribute, homage to the emperor, they, uh, they seized power effectively uh, a few days after Sunday 21 or June 20. So who were these people? These people were junior officers and NCOs and privates, who came from various parts of the country. Some of them were, uh, you know, people who were sent because they were not, uh, they were not uh, desirable characters in their own uh, garrisons. But a number of them, uh, quite a few of them, now we discover, were people who were politicized either during the student movement or uh, during the revolution. Uh, and they were very angry people. The account that we have is, you know, very angry people who feared the system very much and who, uh, who believed that they have to act and act very harshly in order to survive and gain victory. So, the weeks after that, you know, they go uh, into their actions one after another, which was widely appreciated by the intellectual community uh, of the country, by, by the public at large. This is, you know, they confiscated the property of some of the important lords, they put prison, people in prison, Without any, uh, without any care for the law or for rights. Uh, so between June and September, they got used to this action of uh, being above the law 
above any any moral restraints and so on. And on June, uh, September 12th, they took over power. Immediately after they took over power, we see them carrying out very, very strong acts of repression. The labor union was suppressed very quickly. The, they showed their uh, teeth to the radicals. For instance, Shadrachole was thrown into prison. Uh, the, some of the army units who challenged them were crushed, like the military aviation, Imperial Bodyguard, and so on. And finally, we come to the November 24 killings, which they say was something motivated by General Amman's resistance to Venezuela and Maria. That's what you find in the sources. Now we see that it wasn't actually General Amman. It was something that, took, that was very carefully thought out, and uh, for which they took quite some time. The executions took place on the 24th of November. On the 14th of November, we find Mengistu Haidemara going around the barracks in Addis Ababa and around Addis Ababa, giving them lectures that you know they were the ones who were actually and intimating that people like General Aman were the wrong guys, had 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 abandoned or betrayed betrayed the revolution. In order to raise uh, the, in order to mobilize the support of the units around Addis Ababa for what they were doing. Three weeks before the massacre, they put an immense pressure on the inquiry commission to come up with their verdicts. And the inquiry commission people refused to give their, ver their verdict because they said, it takes time, you know, the investigation. Mengistu and the other members, at one time, this was even before, uh, Aman moved out of, uh, and, you know, stayed in his house. Uh, on one of the meetings, the question of these people was raised, the third meetings, chaired by Aman. Aman uh, came in and said, look, you know, we have to give them the right, we have to, we have to give these people the right to be brought before the court, and to be, you know, tried, fair, why should we decide uh, in advance, you know? And so that meeting failed. And the next meeting, when it was held, we do not know, Eventually, we know that Mengistu and his group decided, in order to carry out their act, they have to get on board all the Nusderk committees from around the country. Uh, and this was decided uh, in the week uh, they killed the people. They, they were killed uh, on the 24th of November, Saturday. Sometime at the beginning of the week they decided, calls were sent out to, the, to all the uh, Nusderk to send their representatives possibly their chairman. And these people arrived uh, on Thursday, on Friday, and there they had their discussions. Uh, and as you see in the letter that was, uh, that was that briefly a letter was shown that Mangistu had written on that day, they had decided to kill 54 people, actually. At the end of the whole ceremony, they ended up killing 60. Uh, and they had already decided where to kill them, and so the time, the time in which they were killed, it was, uh, but then eventually when the executions were taken out, the time was not respected according to the letter because the, uh, the, 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 the events with General Aman uh, took more time than expected. It was expected that General Aman was, would be captured, not uh, resisted by fighting. So Aman resisted. That changed the story. And then they told the public, and the public accepted it, that the executions took place because Aman resisted and was killed. And the, 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 the fear that this brought about led to their officers. No, no. <coughs> now we see that it was, uh, it was decided uh, over, over several days, and uh, there was some, quite a bit of thinking behind So we come to 24 November. Uh, and then after that, uh, from December 1974 to, to the summer of 1974, again and again and again, executions without trial, arbitrary arrests were carried out. And this was announced on the radio. All of you know, if you know that those of you who were, uh, who, who, who had reached of age in those days, remember very clearly, if you know that day, which preceded the announcement of the executions. Uh, many people were executed. Uh, Without, uh, without trial, arbitrary arrest, and so on. Uh, even dead members were not spared. And the climax of this period, from uh, December 1974 to 
school, summer of 1976, was the, the killing of Sisai uh, Hapte, a uh, prominent uh, member, and a large number of civilians and so on. Uh, over, 20, uh, over 20 people were killed. Uh, that was announced that others were killed uh, in uh, Devrazet and so on. Of course, we have to wait in order to find out. In 1976, in the summer, the, there was a fierce quarrel with the Dirk. Uh, the group uh, proposed that we should, they should launch a campaign on the APRP, a, can, a campaign of elimination. Uh, other members, like Mogus and so on, uh, opposed this. Uh, this uh, this proposal, and uh, at the end of the process, Mangus to warn, and a campaign was launched against the APR in September. And you see an attempt on Mangus to uh, many uh, Mason revolutionaries and other revolutionaries who were working with the government were killed uh, by APRP militants, and the Derg also hit back. Now, 1976, 1977, and 1978 were uh, the, worst, uh, the worst years. In 1977 and 1978 were the, uh, the beginning of 1978, actually. 1977 was the worst year, the year of the Red Terror. How many people were killed in those days? You know, estimates vary from 10,000 to 150,000. And here is a young man who is studying the Red Terror. He, he uh, should be in a better position to bring out all the estimates given by different scholars. But the fact remains that we have to do quite a bit of adding up by doing the local history. The way the Russians uh, did their work after the communism collapsed, it find out to establish how many people Stalin killed. So, thousands were killed. I think that is a sufficient statement, uh, rather than giving a figure to be on the same side. What were the centers of the, uh, of the, of the, or what, what were the killing grounds? Karcelli or Alebaga is already identified as a major prison, uh, but we have to go one step further and establish an inventory of all the prisons. This is very, very important, the inventory of the prisons. Horror stories uh, is what you find, but still we have to, find, we have to establish inventory and maps. <coughs> There was a Derg headquarters, the Palace of Milnik, where large numbers of people were killed. Uh, people like Tafari Bente, Adnafo Abate, the very prominent ones, the emperor himself, were all killed in the palace and buried in the palace, probably. Uh, then you have the Ma'akalawi, a very terrible place. Then you have the 4th Army Division, which was not a killing ground, uh, but still, you know, it kept prisoners uh, all through the Derg period. Then you had the Bermuda Triangle, it was called Bermuda, the name itself, this was the name given to it by the victims and their relatives. Uh, the police stations, the police stations around Addis Ababa were also an important prison houses. Uh, Marara, for instance, gives a very good description of Sebastian Polistaga, which is in Kazakhstan. Other memoirs have been written uh, about other police stations. Then the Kaftania prisons. The Kaftania prisons were, you know, real heads. Uh, some of them were very, very notorious. The one near uh, Uraed and the Arada Kaftania, the Kaftania Asr, up on the Gulele Road, on the Bojam Road, the Agaki Kaftania. These were terrible places of human butchery and uh, human torture. Uh, extremes of human cruelty were seen in these places. Finally, the Kabale prisons. So you have many, many, uh, uh, and who are the perpetrators? Was there mass participation as Professor, uh, as Professor Andreas said? In some sense, there was, um, there was, uh, there was wide participation in the killings and in the torture and so on. And this participation was not only on the, on the basis of instruction. It was motivated by local, local interests, local views, uh, exactly as Ian pointed out quite a while ago. Now you have the revolutionary defense squads, uh, the cavalry chairman and the revolutionaries mm -hmm. and so on, you know. The revolutionaries were one group, the cavalry the defense squads were another group, the, the investigation offices of the government itself, you know, the, the political crime investigation offices, so there are different groups.
carrying out their arrests, arbitrary arrests, killings, and so on. There were many people who were arrested by Mr. X, who were then killed by one or another party, and then who could not be released because their captor was not there to tell why they were captured. So there were these different groups of people were involved. And when you go to the border and and uh, uh, Burage land and Wollo and Harar, just to give you the most notorious cases, otherwise in many other places there were these types of crimes. Again, uh, you see similar participation in Gondor at the highest level, you have Malaku Tafara and a number of other people. As you go down the scale, you, you, you reach the level of Kabali people who had their own hands fully in blood and tears. Now, to conclude my statement, I am given five minutes and my five mi additional five minutes are up. Uh, one is, we have to preserve some of the prisons before they are demolished in Addis Ababa. There is this mania now in Addis Ababa demolishing buildings right in the Some sense must be, must go into the minds of the people who make these decisions and some of the prisons must be preserved. Bermuda, for instance, deserves to be preserved. Uh, some of the Kaftania prisons have to be preserved. Uh, the Gondor prison is preserved, fortunately, because finally when, the, during, uh, when the, hostage, the, the prisoners got more and more, Manus, uh, Manaku decided to use an important heritage building, uh, one of the castles of Gondor, Rasti, as his torturing and killing area. And that's heritage, so it is there. So now we know the room and where they were tortured and so on. <coughs> but if you go to Buragi, it is lost. So you have we have to do something about you know places like Buragi where traces, all the traces of those things are disappearing. We have to go to Desi. So we have to go to Hara uh, uh, and so on. Uh, finally, the archives. Uh, I have already made a call, appeal, uh, at the beginning of my lecture, now I repeat it. Something must be done to make the archives accessible to scholars uh, before they, they are damaged and so on. And, you know, institutions like the one that, that we are now, uh, that has called us together here, institutions like this, uh, or the inter africa group of Atatamba, uh, should also call upon the public to donate photographs, private letters, diaries, uh, you know, by the victims, by the families, by their loved ones, and so on, to donate it to a certain public, public space for future research, and so on. Uh, one good public space is that Saba University Institute of Studies, where already there are a sizable number of documents and photographs uh, for, of, of these things and many other things of the period of the dirt. We need these things very much because we need the memory. Uh, you have seen here the Never Again uh, that was put up in the, in the, in the museum down at Muscat Square. For, for this Never Again to take root, we need to, to have a lot of research. Most of the story has to come out. We have to have places that keep the memory, and prisons are wonderful places to keep the memory. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh,
I'd like to thank Mr. Campbell for his uh, stimulating overview of the history of the Italian massacres, and also Professor Schipperdell for setting the scene uh, so well on the uh, background of the Red Terror and, and some of the key issues that we need to address here. Um, I think he's been raising many of the important themes uh, for discussion, and I think we have about an hour for discussion now, so I'll limit my comments to the first uh, 10 minutes or so, and then I think we'll open the floor if I'm not mistaken. Um, now, I'd like to pick up a few of the points from uh, Professor Schipperdell's um, presentation. I'd like to add a few others, and maybe to make one or two controversial statements as well uh, to lead us into the discussion. Um, what I'd really like to do is to um, analyze the, the concept and the logic of violence in the revolutionary uh, terror in Ethiopia. Um, so, instead of a history of events, which I think we've received very well, just pick up some of the key themes uh, that drove the violence. <laughs> Um, to begin with, Professor Schipperdell has raised the uh, question of the number of victims and I'm afraid, uh, in spite of what he said about me, I won't be able to say very, very much more than what he has said. Um, estimates range from Mingisto Haidamarian's own 2000, um, which is an incredibly low figure, uh, to the 500,000 by a former EPFP leader uh, who's writing under the pseudonym of Babila Tora. Um, again, um, he, he calls it a conservative figure. It is certainly not a conservative figure. Um, these numbers, however, bring up definitional issues. <coughs> I'd like to touch on these briefly. I'd like to suggest that the concept of red terror, which we're dealing with uh, as the sort of working term in this conference, in one sense is really too narrow a concept, and in another sense, perhaps, is too broad. Um, let me explain what I mean. I think it's too narrow because, technically, red terror really was uh, a campaign of state terror in late 1977 and early 1978, uh, officially launched uh, by the Dirk. Um, and that definition, of course, would ignore um, earlier state violence, and it would also ignore the terror of other actors, most notably, of course, the assassination campaign by the EPRP. From another perspective, though, it's also too broad, um, because it is sometimes applied to any state violence uh, that was carried out during the Dirk regime. Um, and thereby, it, I think it loses some of its specificity and some of its analytical grip. Um, so maybe some, some of these issues about how we actually conceptualize the Red Terror, what exactly we're addressing. Are we addressing all of state violence uh, during the Dirk or only uh, specific violence, say, uh, urban state terror? Um, some of the issues to pick up in the discussion. Um, how many victims? As Professor Schipperau has indicated, we really depend on future research on of local history for that. Um, Amnesty International and uh, Professor Britzke speak of about 30,000 dead in Addis Ababa alone, and I think that represents pretty much an average estimate in the literature. The concept of red terror may also be problematic um, because it doesn't engage the mode of violence that define the period. Um, red terror uh, conjures up images of state terror, and which of course the period witnessed plenty of, and we, we already heard and we hear more about uh, the violence in the prisons, the executions, uh, and so on. Professor Schiffenel has already told us, however, that much of the violence was highly local. It was carried out by local actors on the ground. So Ethiopia's revolutionary violence, in many ways, was bottom-up as well as top-down. It was carried out by local actors pursuing local agendas as much as by actors which are perhaps fully identified with the conflict's master cleavage. Local actors use the narrative and the resources um, provided by the state to establish highly localized reigns of terror. And I'm thinking here of the most famous cases, of course, you know, Birma Kapide in the Arakilo area, people like Alvesa Negeo, um, Samrat Mamo in Gulele, and uh, again earlier, Professor Schiffler brought up um, Melako Tefera in Gondor. Um, this local dimension, of course, is part of the reason why the terror affected all of social life as profoundly as it did. And there's a lot of research yet to be done in this context. Um, just a very short word as well on the onset of the terror in September of 1976. Um, Professor Schiffer has given us a very carefully balanced view, um, which is rare in the historiography. Um, let me briefly comment on two of the common arguments in this context. Sorry. Can, can you hear me at the back? Um, on the one hand, there's a common argument that the EPRP's violence in September 1976, the assassination attempt on the Mariam, 
and the following assassinations, especially of Mason members, uh, were merely reactive. Um, and I'd like to suggest that that view, in a way, is problematic, to say the least. Uh, the policy of offensive defense by the EPMP had already been decided in August uh, at the uh, Central Committee meeting, um, and it split the party to great effect. Um, Professor Schipperau, of course, has indicated recent developments in this area, especially uh, the publication of the book Tower in the Sky. On the other hand, many writers, especially non-Ethiopian writers, um, have tended to blame the EPRP for the onset of the terror, saying that the Dirk really was reacting to EPRP violence. And I'd like to suggest that, at least as problematic, um, the repression within the party uh, was decided much earlier, um, really after the EPRP had rejected the program of the National Democratic Revolution in April of 1976. And again, as Professor Schifferau had indicated, there were squabbles within the Dirk over whether or not to carry out this repression. But it was decided earlier than September 76, when the EPRP launched its campaign. Plus, of course, um, if you read the newspapers in September 1976, uh, the repression of the EPRP precedes the first formal attacks in Addis Ababa. Uh, so I think Professor Schifferau is certainly wise in his account to somewhat sidestep the question about the first bullet. And I'd like to suggest that more important than the question of who fired the first shot um, might be the evolution of a generally perceived um, atrocity environment which facilitated the terror. Um, like Ian Campbell earlier, I would like to highlight some of the ingredients of atrocity um, in this context. And uh, I think these are key themes that we need to look at in order to analyze the Ethiopian terror. And of course, they're not unique to the Ethiopian terror, some of the issues I'm going to raise now. I think they apply to many of the other areas uh, that we want to discuss in this conference. Um, the escalation of the terror depended on the existence of a perceived atrocity environment in which the group that needs to be controlled, that is the EPMP and uh, other civilian regime opponents primarily, is seen as profoundly dangerous. This atrocity environment was exacerbated, of course, by the EPMP's own assassination campaign, which was certainly very successful in striking terror into government circles. Uh, particularly so for, for more members who were its prime targets. And in a way this takes us back to definitional issues. Is the EPRP's violence considered part of the Ethiopian terror? Or do we only focus on state violence for the purposes uh, of this uh, memorial? If we do only focus on state violence, as for example the museum has chosen to do, the Amatas Museum in Muscat Square, um, I think we have to answer the question of how we justify that choice. Um, and maybe that's something to return to in the discussion. The Ethiopian terror was based on a national security discourse. Um, its violence was framed as necessary violence, which was needed to advance the greater national good, linked, of course, to the progress of the Dirk's version of the revolution. Deviancy, therefore, uh, made the centers into enemies of the state who needed to be liquidated. And if you read the government papers around, uh, I think, March of 1977, that word, liquidation, makes the, the front pages almost every day. And again, I think there's some interesting parallels to other cases uh, of collective violence uh, across Africa. Um, implicit in this national security discourse was a definition of the nation, or actually perhaps better of citizenship, uh, that was already highly exclusive and depended on political loyalty to the regime. Uh, which brings me to the last point I'd like to uh, labor here, which is the profound depersonalization of the victim that really drove and facilitated the Ethiopian terror. Um, this depersonalization went beyond uh, merely the torture and the killings of the victims. It went even beyond death in a way by forbidding uh, the mourning of the dead in culturally appropriate ways. Um, the victims were not to be mourned and they were not to be memorialized as persons. And so, uh, to my mind, at the heart of a memorialization project like this one uh, needs to start a reassertion of the personhood of the victims uh, a narrative that denies all violence legitimizing concepts of otherness um, and depersonalization. Um, how can this be done in a manner which does not depersonalize the perpetrator itself um, and thereby cast them as a mere icon of evil, as can so easily happen? Um, I think this may be another topic for discussion. I think it's always a danger for memorialization projects. Uh, and of course, unless the personhood of both the victim and the perpetrator is fully upheld, uh, the identification on which memorialization and, and the warning function of, of the memorial depend is impossible. Um, 
as a final word, I would just like to echo Professor Shifirao's call uh, to think about how to encourage the formation and the preservation of archives on the Ethiopian era. I think there is so much research yet to be done, uh, but the key documents on which this research depends, uh, especially from the Special Prosecutor's Office, I think are, are in a really precarious situation. And if we can do anything uh, to uh, address that, I think that would be one of the great achievements uh, of this conference. Um, on this note, I would like to stop here, uh, so we have plenty of time for open discussion. Thank you very much. discussion here, so without spend, taking too much time, uh, the floor is open, and you can direct your questions uh, uh, to any of the three speakers, uh, not me. <laughs> <laughs> Given what we heard today uh, from the uh, representative from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, a place where President heads of states can go in order to reflect on the sanctity of human life. Professor uh, Andrea Sachete talked about a place where the youth can reflect on how to refuse and resist infractions on human rights. The presentations that I heard today, there are four important themes that I have put together that I think we should memorialize. One, authorization of murder from the top. Two, public exposure of dead bodies, which is in itself an attack on the sanctity of human life. Three, and it is the paradox of terror that is targeting the educated elite of a nation, which in itself, the destruction of a nation's human capital. The fourth point I think uh, Shifaro made is you know, very well, and that is memorializing public indifference. Because some of the youth also approved of the terror that occurred. And perhaps the last one that we should also memorialize, we should find evidence of extraordinary acts of bravery. That is, people who risk their lives in order to save others. These are my suggestions. Patience, that one is excellent. Uh, uh, the young company, uh, you've given us really a very fascinating and very graphic description of the, of the massacre. Compliments for the pictures in particular. Continue to pick the things. Uh, just a couple of observations. I think on the party, they already have, Italy already had colonies. Uh, Italy was looking for a colonial empire. And Ethiopia was always in the past. Eritrea and Somalia, they were minimum, in the minimum program, so to say, of Italian countries. I've always aspired for an Ethiopia. So uh, I think the, all along, Italian colonial policy, there was the idea of <coughs> completing consummating, so to say, the colonial enterprise by uh, conquering Ethiopia. There was also another very important immediate background, which would probably be to say, eliminate your account even better. And this is the summer uh, aborting, or the failed summer offensive of the Patriots, summer of 1976. Uh, there was this, this attempt to, to launch a coordinated attack on, on the capital, uh, which uh, was uh, was not successful for lack of coordination. And as you know, one of the victims of this failure was uh, Abuna, Abuna Petros, who became a martyr, who was uh, 
secret interrogator and the secret individual as Italians. And I think you see some link between his role as a rallying point of the resistance and the vengeful massacre of the monks uh, of the Red Wars. That's one. Secondly, on the question of memorialization, just a minor footnote, the, the monument erected by, uh, that was given to Ethiopia by Tito was the second, actually. There was a much more modest, very modest <coughs> monument which, which photographed on Paulus Sandy at some stage. Uh, it was a very small monument on just by the fence of uh, the hospital. Uh, it was later on, of course, uh, Tito came, he said, you know, Ethiopia deserves a better, or the Marxists deserve a better monument, so we have that one. Secondly, on Rashifara's presentation, he has given us a really painstaking account of the, of the formation of the, of the term. I think there is a very important period between the formation and the deposition of the emperor, which should be highlighted between June 28th and September 11th. Uh, because that was a period when they were able to craft killing to uh, strip the emperor of all his powers. And I think the lessons of the 1960 coup, uh, the failure of the 1960 coup, probably plays an important role because they didn't want to fail again. So they dissimulated successfully their intentions by expressing their loyalty to the emperor throughout those months, and yet at the same time undermining his, uh, his, uh, his power and eventually, of course, uh, deposing king September uh, 74 or the Kudakas. But the push up months were July and August, when he was completely stripped of all his uh, important powers. And secondly, I think when we talk about uh, the conquest of power by the Dirk, we have to see it in two phases. There is a short delay and there is a long delay. When it comes to long delay, the real concentration of power by the Dirk, then the divisions within the left play an important role. It is thanks to the divisions of the left that the Dirk was able to come out supreme. Uh, uh, by 1976, by, by, by uh, April 1976, when they declared the National Democratic uh, Revolution. So, finally, I think, uh, with regard to the general comment on the project, uh, I think the project has to, I know the mandate is memorialization, I think this project has to think about how to go beyond memorialization into prevention. Already, I think the Raga genocide has given us a very good example of what can be done, what should be done. I think it's a very important role. There was a panel that was established to study and make recommendations. And uh, the shift in the AU strategy from uh, non interference in the internal affairs to actual intervention in times of uh, uh, such catastrophes is a very important thing. But I think the project also has been trying to think in terms of going beyond memorialization into prevention. Of course, it's not easy to prevent genocide, massacres, and so on, but at the very least, there has to be a promotion of the culture of tolerance, a negation of the cut of violence about which the discussion is for, because it is this cut of violence in any society that eventually culminates in genocide. Thank you. Very time. Thank you. I, I just want to make certain comments on some of the names um, given. For instance, many cite uh, the, the former prison as Alembekai, uh, which is, I think, a, a misnomer. Alembekai is only one building in, 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 what, in the central prison, or what is called Karcher. Um, and th there were other compounds. There was Ferdenia, there was um, what you call Kataro, and then there were the women compound, and, and also another compound within, um, within Karcher. So Alembekai, of course, has a symbolic value. I think it was one of the oldest buildings in the central prison. Um, and, and the other thing is, I, I hear that there were mass killings, especially during the Red Bear period. As, as Ian mentioned, during the, the, the Italian occupation, probably there were mass killings there. And during the, the initial period, the, the senior officials, including my father, were, were killed in the, um, in, in, in 
her child. But later on, especially during that period when Mary is the that Michael is taken correctly, in fact, her child was far better than the other presidents, as, as Professor Shifarami said. There were several presidents in Ethiopia. There were the Kaftanians, Kavales, there was Bermuda, Makarawi, and so forth. Those were the ones where mass killings took place. I mean, they took prisoners and killed them everywhere. And there were street killings also. So, the, the most of the killings took place outside Karcheli. And if you are to memorialize the, the victims of, of, of terror, especially um, uh, the victims of what we call the terror, which might be a misnomer as, as uh, Jacob said, um, we, we should take into account that the mass killings were outside and, and also in the different uh, regions that we call now. There were also mass killings. So when we were not that it's not only Karcheli, but the mass killings that took place all around. Um, probably the other point I'd like to raise in the subject of discussion is whether we should call, some people call it genocide, uh, the, the killings that took place during the Red Terror period. Is it really genocide? Um, were there ethnic groups or other groups um, specifically killed during that time, or was it political killing, as I would prefer it to be called. So I think that, that also should be a subject of discussion. Um, I, I'll come back later on uh, to the other points, and I should be brief and I'll stop here. Thank you. Speaker, who raised the whole point uh, about this genocide case. I think there's no debate on this issue, because uh, the uh, criminal uh, the criminal uh, and the justice already published during the imperial period uh, says that if a certain group is targeted according to the law, it's uh, a genocide. That's what the, the law says. Not, uh, I mean, uh, prepared after the aftermath of uh, the killings. It's already, uh, it, it was there. And uh, I think the discussion may not be, I don't know whether profitable or not. Uh, my second point is, I heard Professor Schiffer Ross' presentation and uh, in the opening speech that the focus is red terror. Uh, but what about the other side, the white terror? We are talking here about human rights. Human rights, whether that is uh, by Arab group or not, we are talking about human rights. Human were victims. What about the white terror victims? So, I mean, they were not throwing flowers and they were not running on a red you know, carpet. They were, you know. So we, we need to think and to look fairly with both sides. That's what my comment is. Thank you very much. Uh, events that led to the drug terror. I'm wondering if the 1960 coup that was attempted against the emperor and which resulted in uh, a lot of uh, mass killings of uh, higher public officials in a way inspired the measure that the drug took when it, took, uh, when it really uh, went ahead and massacred the 60 officials. Uh, I'm trying to see a link between the 1960 coup and, and the revolution. That particular part of the prison and the general prison. Rather, the point is that in the original times, to memorialize the grounds of uh, the new AU headquarters and uh, the conference hall, there was the idea to preserve specifically the Alam Bakai building. That's why Alam Bakai is very importantly in this. You know. We know there were other sites there, including the grounds, not only the building. The other thing I want to say is, of course, that um, 
There is, as everyone knows, a disparity between the definition of genocide under international law and the definition of genocide under Ethiopian law. Ethiopian law includes under genocide targeting political groups, not simply religious and ethnic groups. And this was, of course, entertained, as everyone knows, when the original international law on genocide came out, but it was blocked by the Soviet Union which was opposed to political groups being included, which was a very unfortunate, self-serving step, which undermined international law, because I believe the Ethiopian law is more faithful to the spirit of, of um, mass killings, mass atrocities, and uh, genocide, because there is no special reason, so far as I can see, to privilege racial, ethnic, or religious groups over others, so long as the intention is to eliminate every member of, the, of a given group, whether it's politically or otherwise defined. Now, uh, I just want to raise a uh, brief question, having said that, about the issue raised by my friend on, on depersonalization, depersonalization of victims and of perpetrators. This is, of course, a pervasive feature of collective violence, and um, it's something, of course, that one has to fight against. One of the important features of the archives and works around the archive is the effort to identify individual victims of the Red Terror by name, by picture, and so on, a work which should continue and which deserves support and praise. Secondly, I think, um, there is nonetheless a salutary dimension, I think, to this collective, the depersonalization, as you put it, that has, uh, goes together with collective violence. For example, in Rwanda, there was continual talk about the psychology of genocide. Of course, I believe what they had in mind about the psychology or culture of genocide is that there is Typically, as everyone mentioned, a demonization of victims, a characterization of them as not fully belonging to humanity. And this was featured, of course, in the Red Terror as well. But the salutary dimension of this in Rwanda, certainly, is that it diminishes or mitigates the apportionment of individual blame. Because there, I think it's reasonable to see, for example, mass participants in Rwanda or what she now called local agents of red terror as being themselves victims, victims of this mass propaganda, of hate talk, and so on. And so depersonalization, if you like, uh, making the agents and victims in a way mundane victims themselves, has a salutary dimension that should be considered as well, because, as I say, it mitigates the apportionment of individual responsibility and may pave the way for reconciliation, something that is still necessary in all these places, Rwanda, Ethiopia, and like. About prevention, uh, which uh, Baharu raised, is a very important question. and. Part of addressing it in memorialization is what was mentioned by a number of speakers, by Ferro and the commentator, namely to preserve as many of the places as possible, including the ones in the regions, so that people remember how the slaughter was next door, carried by their neighbors, by their friends, family members, and so on, and that the victims likewise were often children, barely coming of age. This, I think, as much as anything else, would contribute to the effort at, at prevention. So preservation and, and prevention, I think, are much closer than uh, we might imagine is what I want to say. Thank you. For giving me this opportunity. Uh, 
Um, I, I, I would like to uh, bring to your attention uh, a certain issue in relation to the mushrooming or the emergent literature on rare terror in Ethiopia. Um, uh, this is, uh, I've been reading reviews of, of uh, books that have been written uh, on the rare terror and some of these reviews, uh, starting from dehumanizing the author or mislabeling the author or totally um, delegitimizing the author. Uh, it also goes as far as to <laughs> declare a fatawa not to sell these books. For instance, uh, when the book Yankee Go Home came out, uh, stores in DC and the surrounding areas were told not to sell that. When Mangusta Elamarian's book came out, a certain group scanned it and uh, made it quote unquote available online for free. This was a warning for the authors, for publishers, not to do anything that leads to uh, uh, an organization that might demon the role of that organization. In doing so, they really uh, mis. mis, mis uh, they really hurt it, the publisher. Uh, another book by Yedem uh, uh, Volume 1 and 2, Taklo Teshona. When he wrote, yes, he was a member of EPRIP as well as Mason. But then a certain group, when they wrote this review, they said <coughs> he was even never been an EPRIP. The same happens to uh, Simbatkar. Uh, so there is a parallel trend to stifle debate discourse and to look at critically what had happened during that time. Thank you. The Minister of Justice was asked by the British Ambassador, what is the status of justice this day, Sir <coughs> The Ambassador <coughs> sarcastically smiled and said, justice is suspended because of the revolution. Now, my question is, did during the revolution, or during a situation where a state of emergency is declared, what is the mechanism that, portray, that protects human rights? Thank you. Uh, from Mr. Jaku. Uh, claim that the uh, real terror was uh, decided in advance, well ahead of the uh, EPRP's uh, provocation. So, uh, I would like to. Did, 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 did you hear the book? Sorry, continue now. Yeah, that, 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 that was what I want to do. I want to elaborate on that. Yeah, I don't that. So, so what I'm saying is that the repression of 1976 was decided before, uh, which was mainly a uh, public uh, news, but not many. Um, that's different from the Red Terror we're speaking about in late 1977. So that's an important distinction. Okay. Yeah. Then let me use this, uh, uh, this opportunity to raise that issue. Is there, can we say, PRP provoked that into waging the red terror as a PRP repeatedly claims? Or was it simply an excuse or a, a trigger a kicking point? Simply the killing, I think it was the Ethiopian Kaida, that was 1969. So was that simply a tipping point for Dirk, uh, a, a red terror which the regime would have conducted in? Or can you say if PRP provoked it, then the Dirk obviously have to, have, have to be uh, responsible, got to be restrained as a government, but uh, chose to wage a full blown terror. So, how do you, how, which, which narrative do you endorse? Anyone of you can comment on this. Thank you. And therefore, I don't have to, to because there are no questions to respond. <coughs> there are only a few questions to which I would like to respond very briefly. This thing was a white terror. Uh, uh, incidentally, the names, uh, the concepts, so these were uh, concepts or terms created by the actors at the time. 